Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Byman. I'm the director of the Center for Security Studies here at Georgetown, and I'm delighted to be the one to introduce General Christopher Cavoli. Uh, he is, of course, the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. I think we could spend, really, the rest of the next hour discussing his illustrious military career. Uh, let me single out, though, three aspects of his current job that I think make him almost miraculously the perfect person for this moment of crisis. Uh, he is an area expert on Europe, speaking multiple languages, including Russian. That is remarkable for any individual, but particularly remarkable for the Supreme Allied Commander at this moment of crisis. Uh, he is a great communicator, and when the commander has to be the public face, as well as the person who is directing things behind the scene, that skill is invaluable. Um, and last, I would say he's a great diplomat. And at a time when the military role and the diplomatic role go hand in hand, having someone with that skill set is incredible. I really can't think of the, uh, having someone better equipped to deal with some of the most pressing challenges of the alliance today. Uh, General Cavoli is going to begin by presenting formal remarks. After that, Professor Sarah Muller of the Security Studies Program will engage in a fireside chat uh, with the general, and that will be followed by audience Q&A. Um, so I am delighted to have uh, General Cavoli here at Georgetown, and please join me in welcoming. Thank you. I need those little glasses. <laughs> what was everybody doing out there? Uh, my intel guys never predict anything for me. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, um, what a pleasure it is to be here today. And really an honor as we commemorate the 75th anniversary of NATO with you. Um, but we're not just marking a milestone, we're celebrating really a legacy. So NATO was born out of the ashes of the Second World War, and it has stood as a testament to what nations can achieve when they write, when they unite under a banner of shared values. So for seven and a half decades, NATO has epitomized the collective spirit of its member nations, navigating the twists and turns of history through consensus and emerging stronger with each challenge. That's an amazing feat. In the late 1940s, the aftermath of World War II presented us with a landscape of unprecedented destruction. Europe was fragmented, its economies were shattered, and nations were grappling with the monumental task of reconstruction. And amidst all this, the specter of Soviet expansionism arose and loomed large. So as we stood in the shadow of a war that had engulfed the globe, we were acutely aware of the fragility of that hard-won peace. The lesson of the World War was clear. No nation could stand alone to defend freedom and democracy. And so it was that, in the hope for a better tomorrow, NATO was conceived. The North Atlantic Treaty, the Washington Treaty, bound 12 nations together in a pact of collective defense. The simple proposition that an attack on one would be considered an attack on all. And this has, over the decades, proven to be the cornerstone of Europe's security and, indeed, the peace and stability of the globe. But it was not just a military alliance that we formed here. It was a promise. It was a promise of mutual assistance and a shared commitment to safeguard the liberty and the security of each member nation. In the years that followed, NATO stood against the forces of aggression and tyranny, through the Cold War, when the Iron Curtain cast its long shadow over Europe, the Alliance was a symbol for those living under oppression. It provided a framework for the defense of the West, ensuring the security of Europe and forging a transatlantic bond that has become one of the most enduring features of the post-war international order. Throughout the Cold War, NATO's principal aim was unyielding, to deter Soviet aggression. The resolve of the alliance was tested many times in various crises, 
the Berlin crisis of 1961, Budapest 1956, the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, the unity of the alliance was tested as well. The Suez crisis of 1956, during my own childhood, the question of Pershing II missiles during the 1980s. But despite all of those challenges to our unity, and those challenges which sometimes appeared to threaten the very integrity of the alliance, our political and military leaders could draw upon our common values to ensure our security. It turns out we have so much more in common across the alliance than we don't. So the foundational doctrines of deterrence and defense remained the twin pillars of transatlantic security, supporting NATO through decades of geopolitical tension. And then suddenly the world changed. The Soviet Union broke up, the wall fell, and a world bright with new possibilities emerged. It was not a world without problems, however and NATO did adapt. The alliance formed a partnership with Russia. We imagine this partnership as the inheritor we, we, with Russia, and Russia, of course, imagined itself as the inheritor of the entire Soviet role in the world, it turned out. We established a special consul for a consultation. We conducted exercises together. We saw each other not as competitors, but rather as nations and possibly as friends. And a personal note, it was right during this period that I, um, as a mid-grade officer, became a Russian specialist myself. I thought I was entering a very exciting new time when there were possibilities that were opening that we could exploit for the benefit of not just the two countries, but all mankind. The bloom did not stay long in the rose, however. Difficulties in our relationship emerged as events of the world, not just events about Russia, events of the world brought themselves to the attention of NATO. In the Balkans, tensions exploded into the peaceful post-Cold War. NATO responded by ensuring the collective security of its neighborhood. We established peace enforcement and then peacekeeping missions that have preserved stability right up to this very day. And as you know, NATO remains with K4 in Kosovo. Afterwards, the conflicts in Kosovo, Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan pulled our forces to so-called out-of-area operations. Our focus on collective defense faded, and we instead conducted out-of-area operations to manage crises and to keep the peace. Nations, remembering the alternative to NATO, rushed, rushed to join. NATO did not expand, per se, during this period. We merely opened a door on which nations were knocking. In a series of waves, 99, all the way up to 2017, 14 nations asked to join NATO and were admitted to this club of peace. And so the circle of free democratic nations, which were largely at peace, was growing. And it was ready to solve other problems in the world. But the world changed again. 2008 saw Russia's invasion of Georgia. And then in 2014, the invasion of the Donbass and annexation of Crimea. NATO again faced threats that challenged the very fabric of our shared security. But really, it was in 2022 that Russia's brutal, illegal, unprovoked second invasion of Ukraine fundamentally altered the strategic landscape for us. It compelled us to reevaluate our strategic direction as an alliance. So at Madrid in July of 22, NATO nations reoriented the alliance on the core task of collective defense and instructed Sakir, me soon, to revitalize an ability, our ability, to accomplish that task. This revitalization took shape through the adoption of the deterrence and defense of the Euro-Atlantic area, DDA we call it. It's our strategic approach. It's a significant realignment of NATO's post-Cold War focus. DDA demands that we posture NATO forces and activities to deny our adversaries, which we list as Russia and terror groups, any advantage, to deny them any advantage they might seek in geography, or an advantage in readiness, or an advantage in domain. It sounds simple, almost obvious, but implementation of DDA has led to fundamental changes in NATO's deterrence and defense posture, to the activities we perform, 
and to the way that we are organized to do all of this. The first step has been to create a family of plans to deter and defend. These plans were written in record time and approved last year at Vilnius. They describe how, where, and with what the Alliance will defend its territory, our territory, and how it will deter those who would threaten it. This is key. The last time we had standing defense plans was in 1989. So for the first time in three decades, the Alliance is armed with a set of plans, and these are, again, for the first time in decades, our comprehensive blueprint to describe the force structure we need, the command and control arrangements we need, the exercises we should perform, and all of our activities and investments. It is a wholesale modernization of our collective defense system. It is necessary, and it's hard, but we are doing it. Despite the challenge, the Alliance has exhibited an unprecedented cohesion, focus, and determination during this transformation to conduct large-scale, theater-wide deterrence and defense operations. It's a strong statement about NATO unity that in the three regional plans, which cover a large percentage of the globe and over one billion people's homes, there were no military or operational disagreements among the 31 allies who were then destined to approve those plans. No disagreements at that level whatsoever. That unity of purpose, that unity is what gives us strength. And it's that strength that makes others want to join. And so in the face of the challenges to the alliance, we have actually grown. Finland and then Sweden have joined the alliance since the invasion of Ukraine, the second invasion of Ukraine. They ended traditions, multi-hundred year traditions in the case of Sweden, of non-alignment, and they chose to stand with those who share the values they've always had. Their integration into, natural, into NATO is a natural progression. It enhances the operational readiness and interoperability of our forces. Their accession, accession strengthens NATO's eastern flank, and it sends a strong message of unity and resolve in the face of Russian aggression. As we stand here on the threshold of this new era, the lessons of the past and the challenges of the present guide our path towards securing a peaceful and stable future for all member states. As we mark the 75th anniversary of NATO's founding, I'm reminded of the words of wisdom that grace the crest of Allied Command operations and have guided us through our sometimes turbulent past. That motto is, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. As the Alliance faces our new tests head on, we are vigilant. We are united in our resolve to defend our common values, and we affirm our commitment to the principles that led to NATO's very birth. The road ahead will undoubtedly be marked by challenges, but as we have shown in the past, there is no obstacle too great, no challenge too daunting for an alliance built on a foundation of mutual respect, shared values, and an unwavering commitment to collective defense. So it's in the spirit of those who came before us that we continue to forge a future of peace and prosperity, secure in the knowledge that together we are stronger. As we chart that course for the next 75 years, our past will be our guide. It will guide us through uncertainty. In the enduring words of the first Supreme Allied Commander, Dwight D. Eisenhower, history does not long entrust the care of freedom to the weak or the timid. Now 32 strong, we are neither weak nor timid, but rather we are bold and resolute. For in unity lies the promise of peace, the assurance of security, and the hope for a brighter future for all of our nations and all humankind. Thank you very much.